Okay, guys, got a really short video for you tonight. We're coming to you again from my uh, basement, which I finished myself. What do you think? Do you like it? I call this not my man cave, but my last man cave. Now, you got to be a fan of Nietzsche to understand what I mean by that. This isn't my man cave. It's my last man cave because I do last man things down here. <clears throat> All right, so today we're gonna to discuss um, how the climate, how climate physics can't create the climate. Modern climate physics can't create the climate. Isn't that strange? How does that work? Let's look here. Here's a diagram of modern climate physics. This is modern climate physics right here. They have incoming solar radiation and they divide it by four in order to Spread it over the entire surface area of the Earth at once, and they even draw the Earth as a flat line, because effectively that is exactly what they're doing with the divide by four. They're taking what comes in only over a hemisphere at any time, and with the flux attendant to falling on a hemisphere, and they spread it over the entire surface of the Earth at once, so as to get rid of day and night, and that effectively is spreading this flux out onto a flat plane like a flat surface and they even draw it as a flat surface right so when you do that you reduce solar power to a heating potential of only minus 18 degrees celsius that's what this term is over here the solar flux multiplied by the absorptivity divided by four is flat earth physics that is the solar flux mathematically forced to satisfy flat earth geometry of the earth and when you do that, when you force that to happen with mathematics, this is on paper, obviously, because obviously you're not physically forcing that to happen, are you? you? You're not physically forcing sunlight to fall over the entire surface of the area of the Earth at once. That's simply what they're doing with mathematics. They're forcing some mathematics to fit that idea of solar power falling over the entire surface area of the Earth at once. They're creating some mathematics to force that to work on paper. All right, so when they do that, you dilute the power of sunshine because you're spreading it over area it never falls on. You dilute the power of sunshine down to minus 18 degrees Celsius. So in modern climate physics, solar power, the sun, can only heat things to minus 18 degrees Celsius on its own at the distance of the Earth from the sun. Well, what are you going to do about that? Obviously, there's some climate and some physics and thermodynamics happening that's above minus 18 degrees Celsius, right? So what do they do about that? They make the climate actually drive itself with its own energy. They make the air actually provide twice as much energy and twice as much power than the sun actually provides. That's what you're forced into doing. That's what you actually create. We saw that in my last video. I showed you the reference. I showed you the numbers. Peer-reviewed literature. Peer-reviewed literature shows this flat earth diagram and they show this flat earth math and they say in peer-reviewed literature that the air provides twice the power to the earth than the sun does. Of course, the sun is a ball of fusion power releasing energy from fusion of hydrogen into helium and you actually have a reduction in the mass component of the, that uh, new energetic formulation of a, a helium atom as opposed to two hydrogen atoms and that atoms and that releases free energy that free energy eventually comes to us as light in the air you can't of course state any release of energy that's happening of course there is no release the air isn't undergoing a chemical combustion process or any sort of nuclear process or anything like that they just have to make up that the air provides twice the heat twice the energy that the sun does because of their flat earth mathematics here so when they're flat earth mathematics their physics can't create the climate without the climate creating itself isn't that kind of funny doesn't that seem a bit like circular logic to you? Something should seem a little bit amiss. At the end, if it didn't already at the beginning, with the whole dividing by four thing, and the, I mean, it's a literal flat line. They are literally drawing a flat line. And this math literally does go, is forced to fit this flat line as a flat surface. All right, so what if we use the real sun 
on a spherical Earth with real solar power in real time falling over the Earth. What do you get then? You don't have minus 18 degrees Celsius solar power that can't drive anything or any thermodynamics above minus 18 degrees Celsius. You have real sunshine, and real sunshine at the top of the atmosphere is equivalent to 121 degrees Celsius. It's hot as heck. By the time it gets to the ground, it's still somewhere around 90 degrees Celsius. It's quite warm, spread over the entire hemisphere that it falls on at once. It works out to about 30 degrees Celsius worth of power, <clears throat> worth of uh, driving, temperature driving potential. Well, the point is, in real time, if you have this warmth of sunlight, I mean, you can go out. If you've ever traveled in the tropics or anything, it is so darn hot, right? And you have these uh, towering cumulonimbus clouds being created. The sun in real time can create things like this, towering cumulonimbus clouds of water vapor that rise to tens of that, like 20,000, 30,000 feet, like basically small lakes being risen to 30,000 feet altitude, small lakes, the equivalent of lakes being risen, risen up, lifted up, which takes energy and power and work, being risen up to 30,000 feet in altitude. Minus 18 degrees Celsius could sunlight could never do that, never do that. But real-time sunlight does obviously do that. It has the power to do it because it's hitting the ground with quite a bit of temperature forcing potential, with quite a bit of energy, with quite a dense flux, not the diluted flux of minus 18 degrees Celsius, but the real, real-time flux, which is somewhere around 90 degrees Celsius still when it hits the ground, depending on the, uh, the atmospheric extinction and the reflectivity of the surface and whatnot. Water is quite absorptive, actually. Water is almost 100% absorptive, depending on the depth, and it doesn't require much depth to get that. So you have quite a bit of energy. Obviously, it's the sun driving those cumulonimbus clouds. Question. Here we go. Let's pull it back up. Did this cumulonimbus cloud create itself with its own energy? Because that's what the minus 18 degree Celsius solar sunlight power model, flat earth model of climate physics says. Climate physics says that this towering cumulonimbus cloud created itself with its own power because sunlight didn't have the power to do it. Do you really believe that, guys? That's the result of flat earth physics. That's the result of flat earth theory in modern physics, in modern climate science. So in real time, obviously, the sun has the power to drive the climate. Now you have a binary choice to make. This is a binary distinction. It's one or the other. You can't believe in both of these things at once. You cannot accept both of these diagrams at the same time. It's a binary choice, it's one or the other, and it's mutually exclusive. One is true and the other is false. Which is true and which is false? Does the cumulonimbus cloud create itself or does the sun create it? It's a binary choice and the answers are mutually exclusive. Does sunlight fall over the entire surface area of the earth at once and have only minus 18 degrees Celsius worth of heating potential? Or does sunlight fall over a hemisphere with a power density distribution that goes as the cosine of the zenith, zenith angle, which still gives you quite a bit of power over most of the hemisphere and a power of sunlight that's able to create cumulonimbus clouds? Which is it? It's a binary choice. It's one or the other. One means that flat Earth physics is junk pseudoscience and shouldn't be in physics, and a mistake has been made in physics and science a major mistake because this is everywhere. For example, here's it at Harvard University. Here it is at Pennsylvania State University. And as we saw in my last video, it's everywhere. It is the basis of climate physics. So is flatter theory correct? Or is it a mistake that it has gotten into modern physics? Or is spherical Earth theory correct where the sun can create the climate itself? What creates the climate? The sun or does the climate create itself? You can answer that. I don't know what is wrong with physicists that they cannot answer it. I don't know why they won't face this. I don't know why it's so uncomfortable for them. These are simple things. The safest position you can take as a skeptic is to say you disagree with flat earth theory. That's the safest position anyone in the world can take is to say, 
I don't think I agree with flat earth theory. You don't have to go anywhere else, talk about anything else. You don't have to worry about any minutia or anything else after the fact. You just have to say, I'm pretty sure flat earth theory is incorrect and that's my position. That's a safe position for anyone to take. You're not gonna have to defend it and you shouldn't really be ad hommed and insulted over taking that position. Although people will still insult you for taking that position as ridiculous as it can be. And not just trolls, physicists with PhDs will insult you for taking that position, for taking the position that the earth isn't flat and that it's important and that it's logically important and physically important and relevant to physics. What a clown world we live in, honk honk, right? Okay guys, that was it, keeping it short and uh, yeah, take care.